If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to James chapter 4. Starting in verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motive so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God? Or do you think that Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. But He gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this passage. Lord, you are drawing us so near to you. As Robert was was sharing in his midrash, Lord, you desire to be with us. You desire for your spirit to dwell in this fleshly temple. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would reveal things to us today. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to speak directly to us today. And Lord, that we would take action. And the type of action, Lord, that you are seeking is repentance. Lord, I pray that we would respond in Yeshua's name. Amen. This is by far my favorite piece of passage in James. It really is. There's so many things in James, lots of favorites. But there's really one favorite, like your child, right? No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. That was, that was for David. Um, <laughs> you've got lots of favorites, but one favorite. This is my one favorite. I, I've, I've grown up with this piece of passage for a long, long time. And it was really special this week as I dove into it, how, how simple It really is. How simple in just that reading, I hope, that it just hit you. Just the truth of it. James here is, continues to speak to an audience filled with with true believers and those that just merely profess to believe. And here, he continues to speak directly to that crowd. Today, I'm going to break it up in three different pieces. Uh, 
First of all, it's verses 1 through 3, and then verses 4 through 6, and then finally 7 through 10. We will go back over it again. James gets right into it. He asks the deep question. (laughs) He really does. Where is all this strife and quarreling and fighting among you coming from? Where is it coming from? And he answers in verse 2, does he not? No, excuse me, in verse 1. Is not the source your pleasures or desires that wage war in your members? What's he really bringing light to in all of these first three verses? He is bringing light to worldliness. Worldliness in the church. In 1 Peter 2, verse 11, it says this. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. That is, that is the continual battle that is raging in this body of spirit and flesh. I... It, was, it just happened yesterday. My kids are probably, continue to teach me all kinds of things, all kinds of lessons. And from time to time, I get to share some of those lessons with you. Yesterday, it was in full display. Of, I had a daughter run in, in panic. And it says, Mom, Mom. I was eating. I, I, I was taking a lunch break. So she was pleading to mom. Mom, mom, we had a vote of who was going to be mayor, and a daughter won, and one of the small male child children um, lost this election. And he was crying, right? And I, seems innocent enough. I mean, they were just playing, you know, a town, a, you know, mayor of the town. Next thing I know it, she comes running back again. Mom, mom. <clears throat> it turns out, little boy who was crying started his own city. <laughs> pulled the citizen, pulled the male citizens from the current city. (laughs) And now they were starting a war. (laughs) One of the older male children was very entertained and fascinated, but also we encouraged him to go out and make sure that there was no World War III happening in our backyard. (laughs) Amazing in just how small the rebelliousness (laughs) of just the flesh and people are, right? It just, it just happens in children, it happens in us, and it continues to go on. This, this fighting of the flesh and fighting of the spirit, and it just, I was just blown away. I was blown away. It was just transpiring in my backyard. We see it in business, we see it in politics, we see it in... Society, I mean, <laughs> I, I used to be in business, <laughs> in a lot of facets of business, and I just, it just breaks my heart to see how selfish and the fighting and the lying and the, and, and the backstabbing and the smile, and yet they're, they're not there for you. There was just no love. And you see that in, in business. You see it in politics. I mean, when was the last time we heard anything good in politics? 
We see the, I mean, just the very nature of politics is strife. It's pitting one versus another. We are constantly struggling and fighting and wanting what we want. And when we don't get it, we resort to pretty evil tactics. We see it in social media. Oh, just start looking at the comments. As soon as you make a comment about something about society and stand up for truth, what happens? You get blocked, you get canceled, you get all kinds of name-calling. The tension has just risen. I mean, it's always been there. This struggle of truth versus struggle of, of the spirit and flesh in us reflected in all kinds of ways. In, in commerce, in social media. But is this worldliness in the church? Is this worldliness in the church? And it is. And you can fill in the blanks. But that's what we have to guard ourselves against. This is the thing that just creeps in. Look at this. In verse 2, you lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And whenever we ask, we ask with the wrong motives. This is a wake-up call from James. This is something that he is speaking directly to the audience and speaking directly to us today. Wake up, is that in you? Is the selfishness there? Is the, is the um, ambition and the striving and the wanting for things that are meaningless before God there in you, in this congregation, in the body of Messiah that is found in the world is worldliness in you. And James beautifully, beautifully describes it here. And so moving on in the next section of verses 4, through five, excuse me, verses four through six, he says, you adulteresses. I don't know if he could be any more hard than calling you cheater. You adulteresses, you cheaters. It's either one way or another. In fact, we, we read in Matthew chapter six, verse 24, Yeshua says this. He says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. That is so true. He desires pure commitment from you. He doesn't want a distracted individual pulled one way or another. It's either for him or he's like, no, I'm not going to take it. In verse 5, he says, this is beautiful. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. He desires that. Robert was just talking about that in his midrash. This, this body is made to be a temple of the living God. He desires that spirit to dwell in us. Let's read some of those verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 and 19.
It says this, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is, is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your body. And finally, in 2 Corinthians 6.16, it says this. Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they, will, they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. I'll stop right there. I'll stop right there. The James is pleading here. James is pleading that we have a seriousness, a serious look of worldliness in not only the congregation, but especially in you. And he's saying, are you a friend of God or are you an enemy of God? Are you choosing him? Are you choosing to be filled with the Holy Spirit and having work through you, live through you? He desires that. And he says in the next verse, verse 6, he has more grace. He has so much grace. More grace than we can ever know. More grace than all of your mistakes. More grace than every single sin that you can put up. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he says, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. His his grace overcomes this worldliness that creeps in. And all he's asking is that we address it. And so finally, in this second chunk right here, second chunk in verse 7 through 10, he says, therefore, submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Why do you think he is saying weep and mourn and turn your laughter into mourning? Why, Why is he saying that? Repentance. But not only that, to change your view of sin. Unfortunately, I think we, we belittle our sin. We don't think our sin is that serious. And part of the repentance process is actually to view sin as close to how God sees sin. It, he is dead serious about it. So much so he gave his life for it. So he's saying, change that attitude of yours. See it for what it is and that it is separating you from God. He's saying, mourn, right? Be miserable and mourn and weep and change your laughter into mourning and your joy to gloom. When was the last time you had a revelation of just how deep your sin is against against God? where it just brought you to tears. And it's an invitation here that James is asking for you to come, come draw near. Have you guys ever come to the position of where as you draw near to God, you, 
you sense his holiness and how clean he is and how wretched you actually are. And the closer you get to him, and that invitation is always there, come seek me, come find me. And we go and we start to crawl and we start to go face down because we can't handle the righteousness and the holiness of God. When was the last time that you felt the weight of that sin and saw it as if it was a snake and says, I don't want that anymore. I have crucified Messiah on that cross because of my sin. And so therefore, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter turn into mourning and your joy into gloom. Repentance is a change of heart. That's really what James is talking about. He's saying, church, kehila, congregants, we have too much worldliness in us. And God desires the spirit in us. This is how simple it gets. And so therefore, repent. What was the forerunner? John the Baptist's message, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. What was Yeshua's message? Repent. Amen. Here I am. No different here. The world is raging and wanting and showing its greed and pulling us. The world is here in, in our midst and pulling us. And he's saying, repent. God desires to live in you. And you can't serve him while you have the world in you. So let that sin hurt. Let the weight of that guilt feel it. And draw near to, to you, to him. And he will lift you up. That's how simple this, these, this passage is. I had, just two, three days ago, Junior. Uh, some of you remember Junior. Um, married to Yillian. And they have two kids. Um, Uh-oh. Ruth and I forget the boy's name. He, he's playing drums now. Anyway, um, he called me, and we had recently met with him, mm, connected with him kind of January 2nd or 3rd of this year, very recent. And he called me, and he gave me a testimony. And it was beautiful. That totally encapsulates encapsulates this. And I'm going to share that with you. But throughout the whole thing, I was just crying for how beautiful and wonderful his repentance was. The revelation of truth, of sin, and that he has this confidence of moving forward and living for God. It was so moving. I was just weeping. I'm like, Junior, I, can I share this? He's like, please, share it. So I'm going to share it with you right now. About six years ago, he left here for a very lucrative job. And it was good. I mean, it, it, it benefited his family. Now he's got kind of this McMansion. I mean, we went over there and I was like, this thing is, <laughs> how many bedrooms? How many bathrooms? Dude. How many kids you? You don't even. You can't even fit everything here. I mean, it probably wouldn't fit my family if it was just that big. He was successful by every measure. They were doing well financially. 
But he was telling me when, he, when I got there, he was just revealing everything. He's saying, I'm miserable. He's like, a few months ago, I lost 15 pounds in just 30 days from just stress eating. And he didn't know why. And, it, and ever since he left, he says, I've been a, distant from my, my wife. I've been distant from my kids. And he told me that one time, uh, you know, he had to go to work and his, his girl was saying, Ruth, he was, his girl was, was telling him, Dad, don't go. We miss you. And he was just telling me, I, I, told, I told this little girl the, the adult thing. I, see, all, see, this, see this house? See the food on the table? See the car? I have to go to work so that you can have all this. And then he realized afterwards, what? He realized how terrible that was. He realized had, he, had, he was a slave to the pursuit of success. He's, he wasn't really a greedy guy in terms of money, but that's what he was saying. I'm just re relaying everything as best as I can over what he was saying. He's got a very thick um, Cuban accent, so I can't even mimic it. It's just so thick. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's such a good guy. But he was relaying all this. He was saying, I, he, it just broke his heart that he was neglecting his wife. He had no time for his kids, and he was a slave to success. What he really wanted, he was telling me, I wanted my name up there. I wanted to be known for something. And the expenses came to realize after so many years was that his kids were suffering. His wife was suffering. And he was suffering spiritually. He was disconnected from God. And so he called me. He's saying, Joey, I quit my job. I quit my job and, and, and took a job offer for less than half of what I was making. And I'm free. I'm free. I'm transformed. And he began to tell me over and over again, many different ways, how I repent. I don't want that anymore. And it wasn't the job or, or money. He was chasing after a name. He was af chasing after success. He's like, I'm done with that. I was losing my family. I was losing myself, and I was losing my wife. He was transformed. He repented. So what was what? And I was just crying alongside of him. Because it was just so beautiful, and I related to that. I had a revelation in my own life. I was building somebody else's kingdom. I was putting forth the talents and skills, not towards God, for my own and for others. And I just had to repent. I wasn't doing what he was called me, me to do. I was greedy. I had the world in me. And to be honest with you, I still have some of that world in me. I still struggle with that. Do you? It, with you and your, it was so beautiful. He came to know the truth of his own sin. He came to know the truth of the worldliness in his life. He repented and turned away and took action. These simple verses here, James plainly talks about that process. Recognizing your sin. Recognizing the world in you. Turning from it. Knowing that he loves you and desires to reside in you, live through you, and repent today. So I want to ask you guys, I mean, this is, 
This, I have to continue clarifying because, again, we have world in the church and it affects all kinds of things, even our worship, even the sermons, even the teaching, even the way we relate to one another. But let me just get straight down to the nitty gritty. When we come here, we, it is a worship service, and we celebrate and glorify God in, in singing and the truth, right? And, and we glorify and worship God through the word presented to you. But sometimes, like today, we glorify God, especially through action and repentance. Today is the day for salvation. Today is the day that for many of you, to repent of that worldliness, to repent of some of that stuff in the world that has creeped in into your life. Church, we are living in the times where we cannot be double-minded anymore. We cannot be half the world loving it and half of it trying to love God. It doesn't work. It's never worked. And so he's telling you today, he's always told you, is your heart for me? As Robert was saying, do you love me? Will you obey me? If it is a yes, today is where we change our heart and repent. Today is the day where we seek forgiveness. Today is the day we come and mourn and wail and be broken before God. And it's ugly. It's an ugly process and it's beautiful. Ugly because you're all in tears. Ugly because, well, it's shameful to many but beautiful because you are drawing closer and closer to God and drawing near to his holiness and righteousness. And that's where he wants you, to be filled with his spirit, to be filled with his love. I got away from some of my verses. I'm sorry. I want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 through 10. And this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians, and I'm almost done. This is, this is pretty much it. It says this. I now rejoice that you were made sorrowful. But that, not that you were made sorrowful, excuse me, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to Uh, to the will of God produces a repentance without regrets, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. The sorrow is the same sorrow that James is talking about. This mourning and wailing and weeping and the brokenness because of our sin. owning up to the truth of what is the world in us 
and saying, I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me. God, I have lusted. God, I have been filled with greed. God, I have coveted. God, I have neglected my responsibilities to my family. Lord, I have not loved this individual. Lord, I have constantly lied. Lord, my speech is always cutting. Lord, I live a double life. And so on and so on and so forth. What is the Holy Spirit revealing to you today? What is aspect of the world in you that you need to repent of? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just, um, I thank you, Lord, for this passage. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as part of our worship today, Lord, that there would be a, um, an honest response to sin that only you can bring. And Lord, I pray, Lord, for true repentance as you are always seeking true believers. Lord, may we repent today of our sin and desire your spirit in us so that we may walk in your will. Lord, I thank you for your grace poured out through love and action through Messiah Yeshua. Your grace overcomes this world, Lord. Your grace overcomes the worldliness in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that Lord, we accept your grace today. In Yeshua's name, amen.